Well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, today we're going to be looking at uh, the third uh, lecture in this little series, and we're going to be talking about de Castle Albetier curves in algebraic calculus and the remarkable role that they play. So, Paul de Castle and Pierre Bézier were two French car engineers. Around 1960, they introduced a whole new way of thinking about curves, which has uh, gone on to revolutionize design theory and uh, notable uh, applications to engineering. Uh, computer graphics and, and lots of other things. So the basic idea in our context is um, starting, I guess, with a line segment between two points. So suppose we have um, point A and point B, and we're interested in describing this uh, segment. Then we could uh, specify, say, a point uh, D lying on it um, in the following way. We could say that it's what we get when we start with the point A, and we add some multiple of the vector a, b. Now, uh, in the previous lecture, I've introduced some algebraic notation for that, that we could represent the vector by the combination b minus a. And if we allow ourselves that notation, then we can rewrite this reasonably as a combination of a, so 1 minus lambda times a, plus lambda times b. So we'll introduce this notation as a convex linear combination uh, describing essentially the line uh, between A and B. When lambda is between 0 and 1, then we're actually in the line segment, otherwise we're outside. So this is the basic uh, sort of algebraic starting point. And then we uh, consider, along with Castellan and Bézier, three points. Okay, so we have the points, let's call them P0, P1, and P2, so you might call the control points, and we have the corresponding segments, and then what we do is we introduce uh, two new points, one along here, let's say Q0, and another one proportionally along here, say Q1. And uh, so the definitions here are that Q0 is equal to, say, 1 minus lambda times P0 plus lambda times P1, so some combination of those two endpoints, while Q1 is the corresponding combination of P1 and P2. Okay, so now with those uh, points, we can then join them and then create a third point, call it, uh, say, R0, and R0 then is going to be the same combination, using the same parameter, um, combination of Q0 and Q1. So 1 minus lambda Q0 plus lambda Q1. And, uh, and then the idea is that as lambda varies between 0 and 1, all of these segments slide around. So this, this point moves from here to here, this point moves from there to there, and correspondingly, R0 moves on the segment joining these two points. And the curve that it traces out is called a quadratic de castellan bezier curve. It looks something like this. Okay. And if we allowed other values of lambda, then we would get uh, other portions of this curve. So this is uh, then a quadratic, quadratic de Castellan Bezier curve, and I'm going to use the abbreviation DCB for de Castellan Bezier. All de Castellan should definitely be associated to this whole story. So it's wrong to call them Bezier curves. It's much better to call them de Castellan Bezier curves. Okay, so uh, that's uh, the simplest example, and uh, it's natural for us to ask, well, how does R zero directly or relate to the original control points. Uh, so we have these control points P0, P1, and P2, and in terms of them, we can write R0 by simply combining these two expressions. Uh, we easily get that R0 is 1 minus lambda squared times P0 plus 2 times 1 minus lambda times lambda times P1 plus lambda squared times P2. It's then an affine combination of three points, and these polynomials that appear here are called the Bernstein polynomials, named after Sergei uh, Bernstein, who 
investigated them actually quite a long time before um, Benzier and de Castellan came along. They have actually quite present properties, present properties. Um, so if you graph them between zero and one, then you get uh, these curves and nicely like this, another one like this, and then the other one is sort of like something like that. Uh, pleasantly, in this interval, they all have the exer area exactly uh, equal. The area underneath each of them is uh, constantly one third. Okay, uh, then there's a cubic analog of this. So I'll just draw the pictures without writing the Humean formulas. So if we have now four control points, then we have on these four control points, these sort of secondary points, say Q0 there, and Q1 there, and Q2 there. So they're all proportionally given by the same parameter value. And then we connect them up with two segments. And on those two, we also introduce two new points, say R0 and R1, which are also proportional with the same parameter lambda. And then we have the possibility of yet another segment, say that one there, and on there we put, say, S0. And then it's the locus of S0 that uh, gives us the cubic the Castellano Bezier curve, which uh, maybe looks something like this. Okay, but I'll write it like this, suggesting that it really is a cubic curve uh, as opposed to this, which is always a parabola. Okay, so these are very important uh, curves in, in, uh, in design theory, but I claim that they're also really crucially important in calculus. So uh, the reason is because they have as parameterized curves especially simple form. So such a cubic curve, cubic de castellano bezier curve, has the general form, if we expand it out in the same kind of way as we did that over there, it has the form of a general polynomial, say a0 plus a1 uh, lambda plus a2 lambda squared plus a3 uh, lambda cubed, and then some other polynomial also degree three, b0 plus b1 lambda plus b2 lambda squared plus b3 lambda cubed. And so uh, as a parameterized curve, the fact that we have polynomials here makes this very uh, amenable to uh, analysis from an algebraic calculus point of view. And we're going to uh, explore these in the context of Archimedes' famous parabolic area uh, formula. Um, so maybe before I go on to the algebraic calculus, let me say that these, these class of curves uh, is really the starting point for uh, other families of curves. So uh, things called B splines and nerves are also uh, sort of generalizations or extensions of these uh, concepts, which are were crucial for uh, modern design and uh, graphics. Basically built on this, this very lovely idea. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you just a little bit about uh, algebraic calculus. I'll just remind you, okay, the algebraic calculus is a very new way of thinking about calculus, where we dispense with all infinite processes. So we don't allow ourselves any limits. We don't allow ourselves any real numbers. Anything that involves infinite processes, we, we uh, just let go and we don't involve it. We want to do everything with just high school uh, algebra involving the basic operations of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So the basic object there in the planar situation are, are curves rather than functions. So we're interested in uh, curve gamma, where P and Q are polynomials, or polynomials as I sometimes like to say. And the whole notion of the area is based on a, an alternative to the usual Euclidean uh, version. So the fundamental area formula is for us what you get when you have 
a triangle, okay? So a triangle of, for instance, A1, A2, and maybe A1 is equal to the point A1, B1, and A2 is A2, B2. And then we have this triangle emanating from the origin, O, and the signed area of this triangle, that's the crucial concept, signed area is S of, say, Say O, A, 1, A, 2. If you want an orientation on it like that. And that is by definition one half of this determinant quantity A1, B2 minus A2, B1. So this is the uh, starting point of the uh, algebraic uh, calculus. So we define, we define this as being actually associated to the spline of the, the oriented edge from A1 to A2. Okay. So we can also write this as the sine area of the oriented edge A1 to A2. And then once we have uh, that definition, then we can uh, put uh, those splines together to create more general splines. So for example, we could have a spline that starts with A1, and then goes to A2, and then goes to A3, and then goes to A4, something like this. So we have a spline like this, and in that case, the, the sine area of the spline is just uh, the sum of the sine areas of each of the pieces, A1, A2, A3, A4, that spline there, is by definition the sum of the S, A, I, A, I plus 1. I guess from I equals 1, 2, 3. And uh, that intuitively corresponds to the sine area of this um, polygonal region swept up by the, the spline. Now, what we want to do after we study the linear case with splines is we want to extend that to uh, more general curves where the, the boundaries are given by polynomially parameterized curves. And it turns out that we can do that without invoking any kind of Riemann sums or limits of any kind, actually. So what one does has to be a little bit careful and analyze this situation in the right way, and then find that there are certain, certain properties that are satisfied by this, this sign area for splines. And so this ends up generalizing. This generalizes to give us, if we have a curve, gamma, which is given by parameterized curve, given by two polynomials, P and Q, then uh, if we have two values of the parameter, so maybe P is, is a, as a polynomial in, in, say, alpha, Q is a polynomial in alpha, and then if we have two parameter values, let's say uh, T and U, then we want to define this signed area here of the segment uh, in a way that somehow has the same kinds of properties as the spline version did over there. And it turns out that there is really only one way of doing this, and that's the, the critical point. Um, that um, we want to define signed area of, from, say, from T to U of, of gamma. And it turns out there is a unique way of doing this. There is a unique good way of doing this, where good means that it aligns with the properties of the, the linear spline that's uh, just given by the linear algebra over there. And so we end up getting the crucial formula, um, which, let's say you have a, a particularly simple curve given by uh, gamma equals, say, alpha to the m and alpha to the n, two pure powers, two pure powers from well, let's say, say from 0 to t, just to make it easier. So there's 0 and there's uh, maybe 0 to u. Uh, then the signed area of this thing is geometrically represented by that thing there. That turns out to be, so this is the fundamental formula, is that the signed area from 0 to, say, u of uh, alpha to the m and alpha to the n is uh, n minus m over 2 times n plus m times uh, u to the 
Nem az F. So that turns out to be the unique way of defining it, which is consistent with the linear approach. And then one can generalize that to what I call fundamental theorem of the algebraic calculus, which is that for a general a general curve given by general polynomials, the signed area from t to u of the curve uh, with the in coefficients, um, components p and q, is equal to one half of the Faulhaber, I'll explain this, the Faulhaber integral from uh, t to u of p dq minus q minus q dp. Okay, so what's going on here? So this is the the fundamental theorem that sort of extends the fundamental formula and allows you to integrate any, any polynomially parameterized uh, curve. So what are S and D? So S and D are purely formal operations that are defined at the level of polynomials and were actually introduced originally before Leibniz and Newton um, by Johann Faulhaber in his work on summing sums of powers. So we have to explain that the derivative operation is just given by the formula that d of alpha to the k is equal to k times alpha to the k minus 1. So here k is equal to um, 0, 1, 2, etc. And the integral is given by uh, alpha to the k plus 1 over k plus 1. These are purely algebraically defined things without any reference to either tangents or areas. In fact, that's what how Faulhaber did it originally. He was he had certain formulas and he had to go from one formula to the other, and he realized that the connection was via differentiation in one direction and integration in the other. And uh, so these were purely formal algebraic operators to him. And we can just adopt uh, that original point of view towards derivatives and integrals. Uh, to then establish this fundamental theorem in terms of the, the, the derivative and the integral. And so you, if you have taken a second course in uh, calculus, uh, then you may connect this with line integrals and so on, but there's no need for uh, understanding what a line integral is. This is all sort of independent of the usual story. So we are in possession now of being able to integrate polynomially parameterized curves and then we can investigate what happens. And one of the first and most remarkable things that happens is that we can, we can extend the lovely theorem of, of Archimedes for parabolas to the cubic kicks. Now in my last lecture I told you how to do this for the special case when we had um, functions. But now I want to look at things more generally. So I want to look at uh, Archimedes uh, parabolic area formula uh, in this more general context in terms of general de castellier bezier quadratics and cubics. So Archimedes area formula. Okay, so I will start with the quadratic curve, and I'll use the same kind of notation. Let's say a0 plus a1 alpha plus a2 alpha squared. I like to use alpha as my variable. And b0 plus b1 alpha plus b2 alpha squared. So it turns out that this is the general de Castellau bezier quadratic curve. It's just a little bit of linear algebra to convince yourself that such a curve is exactly the same as a de Castellau bezier uh, quadratic curve with three control points. And in some reference uh, frame, we have uh, this is a, actually a picture of a parabola. But crucially, it's not a parabola that opens uh, vertically or uh, vertically or horizontally necessarily. It's a general uh, parabola. And uh, we're interested in having two points on it. and trying to uh, get at the area of a slice. So we'll choose two points on it. 
And we can represent these two points, say, with the A, which is, say, gamma of, of T, and B, which is gamma of U, the values uh, substituted in here. And so we get this slice of the parabola, and that was what Archimedes calculated. A remarkable first calculation, actually, in, in the history of calculus, is to actually get at this, the area of this slice. And uh, so how does he do that? Well, I'm going to explain it uh, in a way that's conducive to generalization to the cubic case. And for that, what we need is we need the point at infinity. So out here is the point at infinity, which is on the curve. And uh, in terms of um, these things, and in terms of projective coordinates, that's 0, A2, B2. Okay. So if you let alpha sort of get big, and this is uh, so essentially A2 and B2, and, and, and the, this is in the projective point of view. So this is just the point, the unique point at infinity on the, on the parabola. And here is the midpoint of this side A, B. So we're just taking the midpoint, which is an affine thing. And then we connect the midpoint with this point at infinity, and we get a third point on the curve, which we can call C. And, uh, and Archimedes' theorem is that if we draw this triangle here, then the area of the triangle and the area of the parabolic slice are closely connected. So there's the, the triangle, and the slice is just well, everything here bounded by this thing. So uh, if, I, if I say the area of the slice, Slice. If I uh, call that, say, uh, sine area, sine slice area from t to u of, of gamma, okay. so um, that that turns out to be a certain quantity that we can we can evaluate using the formula uh, formulas of the algebraic calculus. So we have. Uh, this, this portion of the curve, we can apply the fundamental theorem. We, and then we also have this spline, we can find its side area, so we can combine those two things to get this, this thing so that we know, after we've done the algebraic calculus, that you, we, can, we can derive this thing. And it turns out to be um, 1 6 of delta 1 2 times u minus t cubed, where uh, delta ij means it's a quantity obtained from these uh, six coordinates. It's ai times bj minus aj times bi. So that's a calculation we can make. And we can also, maybe going over here, also we can calculate that the sine area of just the triangle ACB, that's in the orient the triangle ACB, is one eighth of that same delta one two times the same factor u minus t cubed. And if we then uh, stare at those two formulas, we see well, we, we have a proof of the theorem that goes back to Archimedes. And that formula is that the uh, signed slice area from t to u of this uh, curve is four-thirds the sine area of a c b. That was what Archimedes proved about 250 BC, and that is certainly the first uh, calculus computation, and it was very much in the spirit of, of, of calculus. He, he did a limiting argument, he subdivided it into things, and he made computations. Um, and this is a, it's a remarkable thing, so, uh, because, it, you know, really Archimedes had aspects of the calculus, there's no, no doubt about it. And crucially, it's exactly this calculation that in some sense forms the basis for all subsequent um, 
calculations. I mean, at some level, even a formula like this is really just a, a, a souped-up version of Archimedes' formula. It's just a souped-up version. This is the degree two version. This is sort of the higher degree version. But um, in principle, it's, it's not really that much different. Okay. Um, before I leave this, so I would like to uh, point out a few, uh, just a few related things that actually I don't think were in um, his paper. Um, I'm just going to augment that diagram a little bit with the tangent lines. So if I take the tangent here uh, to at A and the tangent at, at, at B, then I will get a, another point. Let's call that uh, X. So X for external point. So we have a third triangle around which is just the, uh, formed by the, the two tangents. And so we can also, because we can calculate equations of tangents, so we can actually do that algebraically, completely without any uh, limits. And so we can calculate uh, intersections, very much like I, I showed you in my previous uh, lecture. But uh, we can also calculate then that the sine area of the triangle AXB so this big, big triangle between A, X, and B is, in fact, one quarter of delta 1, 2 times U minus T cubed. It's one quarter. So um, it's, well, it's exactly a half of this one. Um, in fact, uh, if I draw this a bit more accurately, it turns out that X is actually on this, this, this line that I've already drawn. And in fact, C is the midpoint of of X and M. And then there's a, a sort of a fourth quantity around that you could investigate, and that's the, the external uh, area, sort of that's in this big triangle, but outside the, the parabola. And I call that a cap area, so signed cap area from T to U of gamma. Well, that's just by difference, that's 1 12th of the same formula, delta 1 2 times u minus t cubed. And so there's nice relationships uh, between these uh, things, so obvious. Um, each you know, one, once you know one of them, you know the others, and the pleasant ratios between them. And I, in my view, these are, these are formulas that every calculus student really should make. I mean, this is the original calculation of Archimedes having to do with parabola. Um, and it's elegant, the answers are beautiful, and it's, to me, incredible that uh, modern calculus courses don't prominently feature uh, this topic. So if you're a calculus instructor watching this, um, please reconsider uh, putting this into your agenda. Okay, so what I want to do now uh, is to show you that, in fact, this uh, Archimedes area formula for, for the quadratic de castellan bezier curve has a remarkable generalization to the cubic situation. Now, I've already shown you that in my previous um, talk on this, but the cubics that we were talking about there were actually rather special ones. They were of the form y equals f of x for some cubic polynomial. Um, now I want to be more general because we have this de Castelliau bezier framework. That means we can deal with these curves in a, in a much more general way. And it turns out that there's a subtle extra condition that's, uh, that's required in order to make things work. Okay, so the object now is to Establish Archimedes a formula for cubic DCD curves. But we'll see that it's not the case that it works generally. We need a condition. So we're going to just extend our, our curve. So now that it has some cubic terms, so let's just write a0 plus a1 alpha plus a2 alpha squared plus a3 alpha cubed and correspondingly b0 plus b1 alpha plus b2 alpha squared plus b3 alpha cubed. Great. Now, uh, with respect to some reference frame, this is going to look something like uh, well, maybe something like 
this, uh, it's, it's, it's all kind of cubic. Cubic. And we're interested in it. Um, two, two points here and here. And as before, we'll say this is say uh, A, which is gamma of T, gamma of T, and here's B, which is gamma of U. And associated to this is this slice, and we're interested in this cubic. A slice and to try to get at it somehow in a geometrical fashion. So it turns out that what's also crucial is the, the point at infinity. So the point at infinity, let me draw it up here, is the point um, zero, now it's just uh, A3 and B3. Okay, so I'm going to now introduce the crucial uh, property that these cubics have. So this is the general de Castellian Bezier cubic, but we're going to just restrict ourselves to special kinds. So we'll make the following definition. We'll say that, that the curve gamma is Archimedean. Uh, precisely when delta 2, 3 equals 0. So delta is the analog of uh, that thing that we saw here before. So this means, i.e., that a2, b3, minus a3, b2, equals 0. So uh, first theorem is that um, theorem is that gamma is Archimedean uh, precisely when It's point at infinity, the point that let's call this i, i, the point at infinity, is a singular point. So what does that mean? So if you have a cubic curve, uh, which is a parameterized cubic curve, then it can have a singularity. So this, this is a singularity called a node, and this is a singularity called a cusp. Okay? So these are places where the derivative is not, uh, we don't have a well-defined line as a derivative. Okay? And uh, so it turns out that, uh, that if you examine the, the nature of this point at infinity, you might get the change coordinates and sort of get an affine view of it. You can see that it's exactly this quantity here that determines whether you have um, a tangent or not. So if this thing is zero, you don't have a tangent, and that's a singular point. Okay? So it's known that, it, it, that every de Castellier bezier cubic curve has a, exactly one singular point, and the question is, where is that singular point? And we're saying, if it's at infinity, then we have an Archimedean cubic. Okay? So in, in the plane, we do not see a node, we do not see a cusp, because the node of the cusp is at infinity. So if we actually looked at it on the plane, we would, we would just see a nice curve uh, like, like this. Okay, so uh, what happens? Uh, well, then I can tell you uh, the corresponding uh, things that happen. is that uh, Archimedes area formula holds precisely when gamma is Archimedean. I.e., what does that mean? So it means that if we're interested in the signed area of this slice, okay, the signed area of that slice, then it's going to be uh, related to a certain uh, uh, point or a triangle obtained how? Well, exactly in the same way. So we draw the midpoint of AB just as we did in the quadratic case. We join the point at infinity with the midpoint just as we did in the quadratic case. And we see where that other point of intersection is. 
and we call that C. And then we look at the triangle formed by these three points. So we have uh, the slice of the curve, and we also have the area of the triangle. And the theorem is that uh, Archimedes' area formula holds precisely when gamma is Archimedean, i.e. precisely when the signed slice area from T to U of gamma, in other words, that blue area, is four-thirds of the signed area of the oriented triangle A, C, B. So not only does Archimedes not only is there still a relationship between this, this, R, this, this region, the slice, and the triangle, but it's, the ratio is given by exactly the same quantity, the four-thirds, the same number that appeared in the quadratic case. And in case you're thinking, well, well surely then this must work for uh, higher degree curves. Uh, as far as I know, it doesn't work for quartic curves or, qu or quintic curves or any other higher degree curves. This is purely a quadratic and cubic phenomenon, as far as I, uh, as far as I uh, and uh, I'm actually going to give you a formula for, for what this uh, signed area is. So uh, it's uh, 1 6 of delta 1 2. Oh, sorry. 1 6 of delta 1 2 um, plus 1 quarter of delta 1 3 times t plus u times u minus t cubed. So that's a like the formula I wrote down in the quadratic case. In the quadratic case, we just had this 1 6 of delta 1 2. And now in this cubic case, we see this additional term 1 quarter with this other determinant condition coming from the, the 1 and the 3 uh, coefficients. And also a factor of t plus u here. Now, in addition, there is uh, some uh, remarkable extra facts that are best expressed when going by going back actually to the de castelnau bezier uh, point of view and looking at the curve as uh, something determined by control points. So in this case, well, we get some additional things happening. So in this case, um, let me draw them like this. So there's P0, P1, P2, P3, now instead of A and B. So here are the control points and our our curve is something like this. Maybe it keeps going like that. Okay, and uh, there's a line here. And there's that point C that we already have. And um, so in this case, uh, if you take the midpoint here, take the midpoint, and you take the midpoint here, then it turns out that C is this point C is exactly three quarters of the average of P1 and P2, in other words, the midpoint of P1 and P2, plus one quarter of P0 plus P3 all over two. So it's actually exactly a line here, and there's a three to one ratio, that's a one to three. So you could, just by knowing the, the, the castelnau bezier control quadrilateral, you can find where this uh, point C is. In addition, so that's one thing that's true. In addition, the tangent, the tangent to C passes through the, the meet of P0 and P2 and P1 and P3. So if we take the tangent to the curve, this, then on it is the meat of the diagonals. That, that point there is actually on that tangent. 
and something else, it's also on, the tangent also passes through, the meat of the, the base, P0, uh, P3, and, uh, and the curve. In other words, if I extend this thing here, if I extend this thing here, then where they meet is the third point on the conic, on the cubic. Um, there's the cubic. It has this line intersects the cubic in three points. That third point is where this tangent meets this baseline. And uh, finally, I might uh, say, uh, finish with the the following relation, that this signed, signed slice area that we're interested in, from T to U of gamma that we've done over there, uh, that's actually three quarters the area of the polygon P0, P1, P2, P3. So if you take the, the entire um, polygon formed by the four control points, then the the area that we're interested in, this one here, is uh, two thirds, of, is three quarters of the area of that uh, of that polygon. I guess there's only one more thing that uh, I should say, just to connect this, uh, because these are not general De Casa basic curves; they are all Archimedean ones. So you might ask, if you have four control points, how can you tell whether uh, the the associated cubic is, uh, is Archimedean, and the answer is this. So here's your four control points, P0, P1, P2, P3. Then the gamma is Archimedean, precisely when we look at the signed areas. So let's call this one uh, A0, so signed area A1, A2, A3, all oriented in the same way. Precisely what A0 is A1 plus 2A2 plus A3. So actually, you can tell whether you're in one of these remarkable situations just locally by the geometry of the, the quadrilateral formed by the de Casquiat Bezier curves. So there's a lot of computations, of course, behind this. And, uh, in my uh, series of uh, YouTube videos. So I have a whole series on the algebraic calculus. Uh, you can find more information. So there's a series on YouTube under Wild A mathematics courses. Mathematics courses, that's where I, I'm posting a whole series of videos on the algebraic calculus, and in particular, I will put up some uh, some details um, of this there. So thank you for listening. Are there any questions, comments? subject. Something that undergraduates could easily um, see and interact with. About the degree four, um, may, is there any reason, any result about the, the constant three over four will change? Or in, in degree four? Yeah. No, I think I think that there's no constant that works. So the, no theorem, the, the theorem just does not work in the quartic situation, at least in the naive way that you might hope for. So I've looked uh, for various possibilities and nothing works that I can find. Mm -hmm. So I think if you found something there, it would probably be uh, more complicated. But it's still worth looking, you know, to try to find something. But uh, it's definitely different from the quadratic and the cubic situation. Can you say that there exists no constant satisfying such Yes, if you actually want to have exactly this thing here, I've, I've looked in the end. Uh, well, of course, that's not entirely clear. I mean, I've, I've looked only for the um, quartic functions, which are quartic curves, which are uh, given by functions. Mm -hmm. So it might be that if one restricts oneself to some 
certain class of cortex that, that maybe something happens. But if you just consider yourself um, functions of form y equals f of x, where x is a, a fourth degree thing, then nothing like this works uh, if my calculations are right. It's a polynomial, right? Oh, yeah, polynomial. Everything, polynomial. Everything's a polynomial. Degree four. degree 4, so y equals f of x, where f, f is a polynomial of degree 4. Um, I cannot see how any of this um, Archimedes area formula works. I don't believe it does. All right, well, thank you. <laughs>